welcome. Uh, hi. <laughs> welcome to uh, Building Your Bench, Preparing Future Leaders Through Partnership. So this session is going to focus on just that, talking about um, leadership and building capacity for leadership and leveraging partnerships to do that. Um, so actually, there's a good description there of what the session is, an interactive session, which will provide practical ideas and examples on how your school can prepare educators to lead and build leadership capacity in your building through partnerships. And we've got a, a great um, panel today representing kind of a range of different um, context. I've got a, a rural perspective and an urban perspective, and, um, and I think you're going to be pleased with the, the information that you hear today and also with how they're going to work to make this um, an interactive experience for you that you can take away some, some practical kinds of ideas going forward. So let me introduce our uh, two panelists today. So um, Trisha Brown Fregno. Farino. 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 I'm silent. I should have asked you that before. I'm sorry. Um, so Tricia Brown Farino is an associate professor of educational leadership studies at the University of Kentucky. She directed two rural-based leadership development programs funded by the U.S. Department of Education: Principals Excellence Program for principals and administrators, administrator credentialed leaders, and team development for instructional leadership in restructuring high schools for principals, teachers, students, and parents. She served as senior researcher on the recently conducted Wallace Foundation Evaluation Studies, Districts Developing Leaders, Lessons on Consumer Actions and Program Approaches from Eight Urban Districts. Dr. Brown Farino is past chair of two AERA, American Educational Research Association Special Interest Groups related to leadership and is a founding member of another one. Um, she holds a bachelor's degree in secondary mathematics from Florida uh, and a master's degree in special education gifted education from the University of South Florida and a doctorate in educational leadership and innovation from the University of Colorado at Denver. So Dr. Farina, welcome. And then I'm also going to go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Tozer, Dr. Steve Tozer. And I'm, am I pronouncing that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, Dr. Tozer is professor of the College of Education at the University of Illinois at Chicago, UIC, and founding coordinator of the EDD program in urban, leadership, urban education leadership, which prepares principals to improve student learning in high needs urban schools. He was president of the American Educational Studies Association and the Council for School Foundations of Education, and was former head of the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Um, Dr. Tozer has served as chair of the Governor's Council on Educa Educator Quality in Illinois and chair of the State Legislative Task Force that led um, to changed st school principal certification il in Illinois. His district-level collaborations with Chicago Public Schools have, fun have been funded by the Broad Foundation, Chicago Community Trust, the Macar MacArthur Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and others. He is lead author of a textbook for teachers, school and society historical and contemporary perspectives and um, lead editor of the Handbook of Research and Social Foundations in Education. So we have a very prestigious and esteemed <laughs> panel today. Uh, that was a mouthful. Um, so, um, and I guess I didn't introduce myself. I'm Sarah Raitt. I'm from the American Institutes for Research. I work mainly on the RHEL Midwest, the Regional Educational Laboratory of the Midwest, which is a federally funded lab that serves seven Midway Midwest states. And, um, we also have some other folks from, from AIR in the room today. So our room host is Ileana Caseros. <laughs> and uh, she works mainly with the National High School Center. And then Helen Duffy. And Helen, uh, I'm where, what do you mainly do within, our, within AIR? also with the National High School Center. Okay, so um, so we've got a, a great group here today, and um, I think we can go ahead and get started. Okay, great. Me first, right? Oh, you're going first. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I have a lavalier mic. How's Perfect. that doing? Great. Can you guys hear this okay? Um, you know, I realized that we could have dispensed with all of the credentials that you just heard on both of us, because I think what really matters here is that both of us are are practitioners who are engaged in the, prog in the processes of trying to produce leaders who really make a difference. And everything else on our, on our Vita <laughs> is less important than that, that we're both engaged in, in really highly intentional and sustained over a number of years processes to try to produce leaders that actually are cut above what we're used to. 
um, in terms of uh, leadership production from higher education. The very first uh, comment here that, uh, that we see is one that you're probably well aware of. This one comes from Leithwood's most recent work with Wallstrom. The effects of school leadership directly influence school and classroom conditions as well as teachers themselves and indirectly influence student learning. There's a sense in which Leithwood is trying to get more accurate than some of his earlier comments, which is sort of misleading. And the research that Leithwood did early or in his career and that many of you may be familiar with are, are often quoted as saying, uh, school leadership is the second most important thing in terms of influencing student learning in schools. But then when you unpack that, you realize that the reason he's saying it's second most important is because statistically, the most proximal variable is the quality of, of classroom instruction, right? And in our program, what we have uh, come to believe is that the single most powerful influence on classroom instruction is school leadership and organization. And we're demonstrating that year in and year out. In other words, we're not going to get high quality classroom instruction, classroom after classroom, in the absence of outstanding school leadership. So for me, this even understates it a little bit, even though this is an accurate statement. OK, let's go to the next. Um, what we're going to talk about today is, uh, is building uh, school-wide leadership capacity and asking what it means in practice and why it matters for school change efforts. And we'll talk a little bit about Illinois and a little bit about Kentucky. Okay? And I'm going to start with something that's uh, not very visible to you, but something that I hope all of you who are interested in high schools will uh, really pay some attention to in your own work. Um, District 214. Uh, in Chicago, in, in outside Chicago, western suburbs, some of you may f be familiar with it. It's the second largest uh, high school district in Illinois, only behind Chicago, and it has six high schools only in the district. So Chicago has 130 high schools, and the second largest has six. Um, six large comprehensive high schools. And um, what District 214 began to do was to track the growth of its freshmen through the ACT exam in the junior year. Let me just, uh, I need a context question. How many of you are from Illinois in the room here? How many of you are not from Illinois? Okay, that's useful for me to know because I can explain a couple of things as we go. Illinois uh, requires the ACT for all juniors in the state. And this matters, of course. I remember a time when there were high schools in the state of Illinois in which nobody took the ACT. Uh, and the reason they didn't take it is because the high school administration in that particular school I'm thinking about right now um, made the determination these kids aren't going to college anyway. It just doesn't make any sense. We now require all students in the state to take the ACT. So this is particularly useful because now we use the EPAS series, Explore, Planned, ACT. And there are all kinds of statistical problems with that. However, you can really track student growth from freshman year to junior year using a formula called the growth from entry metric. Now, this growth from entry metric, I'm going to spend a minute on it and then try to move more quickly through the other slides, is really interesting because what you see in Chicago public schools for non-selective high schools, which is like 110 of the high schools in Chicago, they have a growth from entry metric of 0.19. I won't go into how this is calculated, but it's simply a value-added score from freshman to junior year on the ACT EPAS series. In Chicago public schools, the value added is 0.19 on this ratio, which means that Chicago public school kids actually lose ground against the rest of the country. In their, they actually end up worse by their junior year compared to the rest of the country than they are as freshmen. Interestingly enough, if we take our selective enrollment high schools, which statistically are the best high schools in Illinois, these are, high school, these are just magnet schools that are accepting students on the basis of test score proficiency and which hire teachers who are themselves have demonstrated the ability to work with high-end kids. You know what's happened in our, in our, these are the number one, number two, number three highest performing schools in the state of Illinois. Their growth from entry metric also is so low that those students are actually losing ground against the rest of the country. In other words, the fact that these kids have the highest ACT scores in Illinois has nothing to do with the education they're getting in the high school. It has everything to do with the selection index freshman year. The reason I think this is important for all of you is that as you're looking at high schools, you can do a growth from entry metric and find out for any high school or any high school district, are these students showing growth from freshman to junior year above and beyond national averages in which case they would actually be closing a gap or extending a gap, or in fact, are they losing ground? And what you find here in District 214, for example, is the highest single uh, gem score in the state is Hersey High School. 
Kids at Hersey High School routinely, 75% of the kids who enter at a 13 to 16 equivalency by their junior year have a, 75% of them by junior year have an equivalency of, have an ACT score of 20. This is the only high school we know that's producing this kind of results, but we have other high schools that are producing similar results and they're producing it in the ways that you would expect. They're doing good curriculum, good instruction, good assessment and strong professional development, right? No secrets here. I'm putting this on the map to say we have ways of actually tracking whether high schools are building the capacity that is resulting in student learning outcomes that are extraordinary. And secondly, we don't know of any cases where this capacity is being built without strong school leadership. Okay, let's go to the next. And it's, it's your turn? Yes. Okay, good. We will do a quick switch. Like many of you, can you hear me? Like many of you, I worked as a, in a high school in an urban center, the 10th largest school district in the nation, Hillsborough uh, County Public Schools in Tampa, and then moved to Denver and worked in obviously a large metropolitan area. When I moved to Kentucky, I suddenly went into a state that is predominantly rural. In fact, only Louisville, Jefferson County, is the only true urban uh, school district of the 174 in Kentucky. So suddenly, I discovered the challenges of working in a rural um, district. How many of you are from rural districts? Got a couple of you, okay. What's interesting is the challenges in the rural districts are identical to the urban, but the differences is has to do with capacity, what's available. Because oftentimes you are in a, a district where there is not a higher education institution nearby, there are not large businesses, and you don't have the luxury of um, bringing in other people into the school. In other words, it's a real grow your own, build leadership capacity with what you have. What I have on the slide here is called Team Development for Leadership in Restructuring High Schools, which was an, a year-long project in eastern Kentucky in central Appalachia. And these four high schools had to improve. It was one of the requirements in the state, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and I want to say, uh, Steve, we have all the same things. ACT is now required, and we have the annual review and audits uh, and performance based on student performance. So we talked to folks in Eastern Kentucky and found, okay, we really need to do something, something very, very different. So we met with the district leaders and the principals and we came up with the idea, let's look at redefining school leadership. Not as a function that's not as a responsibility of the principal, but instead, it's a function of a group of people involved in collective leadership. So we said to the, each of the high schools, prepare a team, a leadership team, with 10 members. Our only requirement was that we had to have at least one parent rep, two student reps from the sophomore junior year. We had to have the principal. But the rest of the configuration had to include, of course, the teachers they wanted. It would include other additional people that you would like. So we formed these teams, and the intent was of this project was to reconceptualize school leadership as a function of these collect, this collective leadership of the team. And we worked hard in the Summer Institute to help them understand what leadership is. They did the DISC assessment, they did the Myers-Briggs, they learned what, what it meant to say, we don't all have all the strengths that are necessary to, to be very strong in our leadership, but what we have is the collective strength. And so as working as teams, they would defer to in other folks. One of the most interesting outcomes of this was the idea of using students. And when we talk about leadership capacity here, the students and the parents had a voice now that they truly could share in what they were doing. 
I thought it was real gutsy of one of the principals. The students came to them and said, we'd like to do a survey of all the students and find out whether the students, our peers, like coming to school and what are we doing in the classrooms? And the principal said, you have my blessing. And the team made the commitment that the students would do this research separate from what adults, and they would share the findings at the retreat that, sum, that summer before school started. And these two students were so committed to including the voice of all of the students that they made sure that every one of the groups, you know, the little cliques and groups that are so common in high schools, made sure that those voices were heard. And when they shared the results to the faculty, they let them know, you're wasting too much time at the beginning of class. Come in and start class. Don't make excuses for our performance. Expect, expect us to perform. It was very fascinating to see what they shared. In the course of the, of the year, they did action research as a team and it informed and guided their school improvement process. Of the four high schools, three made tremendous progress. I have to tell the other story because it's important. We talk about leadership capacity and we talk about building the bench and about we talk about principal succession. And again, I want to say that we were in rural schools where you don't have a lot of other people who can come in from across the county from one side of the county to the other because it's too far to drive. And Appalachia is unique in that it has historically where the Scotch-Irish settled and so the notion of clans. You've heard them say in Appalachia, they talk about the hollers. It's literally the, the valley between the very tall mountains and you know you're in a certain town by the last names of the people there. It's, it's, it is the most fascinating study if you go into the science of sociology and, and human people. But what happened at one of the schools, the principal left. He was promoted into the district office. The two assistant principals then began to campaign that whole year. To, they really worked to become the principal. And it literally split that school apart. One of the lessons that I learned from that experience and, and having the teacher share in the interviews that I conducted was the critical importance of succession planning and that if any of you are all principals, you know one day you're going to leave. And so that lesson is, be sure that you develop your replacement and be sure that you leave your school in such a way that the capacity to continue the improvement, to it, the capacity to focus on student learning is there whether you walk out of the door or not because of the four uh, high schools in this particular project, the one where the dissension over leadership and who would become, they had, this was a project we completed, I think, three years ago. They still haven't recovered from that incredible scenario. So I wanted to share that. In our next slide, I'm just going to mention start and then you start off. Sure. Okay, building capacity. So the title of our session is Building the Bench and how do we do partnerships. So what do we mean by partnerships? Why do partnerships matter for improving student learning? Okay, Steve. I have two factoids for you. Um, one of them is that in two years, all principal programs, preparation programs in Illinois will be shut down. They'll all be sunsetted by law, by law passed by the governor this past summer and they will all have to reopen in partnership with public school districts. Now, why did we do that and why does it matter? I led the legislative task force to create that law and, and to pass it. Um, here's why. Uh, we now know how many people are rural. We also, uh, we, we need to know how many of you are district or school-based versus higher ed? How many of you are district or school-based people right now? How many of you are university-based right now? I sort of wish there were some university people in here so I could say the following with them, which is school leadership is too important to be left to universities alone. Absolutely. It just is, all right? Report after report after report for the past 20 years has shown us how far short our school leadership programs fall. We actually invest less nationwide in the preparation of school principals per person than we invest in each teacher that we produce from colleges of ed. We have a principal preparation program just a few miles from here 
that has 1,700 principal candidates in its program at this moment. Do you really think that this program is about preparing leaders? It's not, all right? It's about tuition. Now, we, this new law in Illinois will put a stop to this because it will make these new programs highly selective. It will also make them required to be in partnership with public schools. And why is that so important? It's important because the public school has skin in the game that the, that the higher ed institution does not. If we produce mediocre people for you, it doesn't matter to higher ed because we've done our job. We've given the credential and you're stuck with the product. If, however, you at the school-based level will really embrace this responsibility to gain some control over the quality of principles that come into your district, and you can do this in partnerships with, public, with, with higher ed. I'm gonna give you four examples right now around the country that have gotten a lot of attention. And if you wanna read about these on your own, you can go to the Rainwater Leadership Alliance website uh, right there, because it discusses all four of these, and these are four different partnership models. The very first one is the New York City Leadership Academy, which is a partnership model with, which in, really involves higher ed only in a tangential way. They use Baruch Academy as a place to get credits for their principal program, but this is truly an academy that's independent of higher ed and that works with the school district to produce high-end principals by having full-year internships, full-year paid internships for principals. I will tell you that all four of these programs I'm about to describe have full-year paid internships for principals. Part of the glory of a full-year paid internship isn't just the experience the principals get, because the only way, as, as Donaldson says, to learn to lead is by leading. But it also allows us to assess the quality of these individuals in a high-stakes leadership environment. We counsel out 20% of our candidates in a program that's highly selective about who gets in in the first place at UIC, for example. And similarly, New York City Leadership Academy counsels out about 20% of its candidates. Another major partnership program that's taking place nationwide that you can read about in, in a new approach is New Leaders for New Schools. There are about 10 such districts that are partnering with New Leaders for New Schools. Again, in some cases with higher ed, in some cases without higher ed. The key here is the district plays a key role in deciding what kind of principles we need and works with the provider to produce those principles. The third one is Gwinnett County, Georgia, and Gwinnett County, which just recently won the Broad Leadership Award, um, is the most extreme of these four in some, in some ways, because in this instance, the school district simply took over leadership preparation by itself. It has a very light partnership with a major university in Georgia, but essentially this is a program where the school district said, we can do this better than higher ed can do it. Now, I work productively with all three of these uh, different groups, the fact is, all of us are experimenting with what would it look like? We all know this, and this is the bottom line for this. We all know that in some cases, a very low-performing, low-income school can be elevated dramatically by bringing the right leadership in place. Am I right that everybody knows instances of this? The question is, can we do this as a rule instead of as a rare exception to the rule? All four of these are doing it as a rule. It can be done as a rule. We used to think great principles were born and not made because it happened so seldom. But the reality is we can do this on a routine basis if we commit to it. All right, let's see the next slide on that. Um, the UIC approach to partnership with Chicago Public Schools, I'll be very quick on this because you can read it for yourself. It starts out with a grammatical error. Um, the district, of, district eligibility criteria for principalship have impact, criteria is plural, have, and that's my fault, have impact on preparation curriculum. The district decides, this is really pretty powerful, and this is true for Gwinnett County, Gwinnett County, Georgia also. Gwinnett County, by the way, is both rural and urban. It's the largest school district in Georgia outside Atlanta, so it covers, it covers the Kentucky case and the Chicago case both, right? And um, it's... Um, it's very interesting to think about these because um, in Gwinnett County and in Chicago, we have our own eligibility requirements for the principalship. Forget what the state requires. Chicago Public Schools decided the state requirements were so irrelevant to outstanding principalship that having a state requirement is a prerequisite for being assessed by the Chicago Public Schools. So in other words, the district decided what the criteria for entering the principalship would be, and any student, any candidate who wants to be a principal has to pass those district assessments every year. 
There are two times a year that these district assessments are, are two periods during which they're given. Everybody has a shot at it. The failure rate is 60%, all right? Our failure rate is very, very small. This year so far out of the eight candidates in this current cohort, that it's seven out of eight have passed in this, in this current cohort. Why is that? Because it is a selective program that works in partnership with the school district and in which the students have a full year of residency before they're examined on this thing, all right? So we can do this. It's just that in nationwide, we haven't done it. Um, we have the district participated in preparing and pre designing the program. Um, our program is more selective than our PhD program. Uh, the district pays for these internships. And as a consequence, out of the first seven cohorts, we have 100% placement. 100% placement out of seven cohorts in principalships or assistant principalship positions, um, with a couple of exceptions who have taken district level positions. Um, our impact on student learning uh, outcomes is dramatic. For example, nine out of 10, you know, we have principals in different quarters of the school system. For example, some of them are in all African American elementary schools uh, that, are high, that are low income. Some of them are in all Latino elementary schools. Some of them are in mixed schools. Some of them are in high schools. And I've given you some data on the high schools, in fact for you to take a look at a little bit later. That said, of our nine, of, of the highest need schools, which were our 10 African American low income schools, um, out of those 10 schools, nine of our principal schools are outperforming district norms in the very first year. Um, and they continue to outperform district, but they do it in the first year because of the quality of training, because we're working to build this pipeline with the district. Um, secondly, um, in fact, most of our people get their principalships after a year or two as assistant principals. So the stage becomes residency, then assistant principal because, they, because the, the competition for principals is high, and then finally uh, the principalship. So there's a pipeline of people who have been prepared in new leaders and in our program, uh, and we have another university that's coming on, Loyola University, with the same project this year. Why do I mention this? Because it leads to my second factoid. I said there'd be two. I predict that under Rahm Emanuel's administration, in less than four years, every single principal vacancy in the third largest school district in America will be filled with graduates of these programs. Why? Because the vacancy rate is only 10%. That means we only have to fill 70 positions a year out of high-end programs. Um, if, in fact, we're seeing, let me say a little bit more about the achievement levels. Nine out of 10 of our people are outperforming. Four out of those 10 were in the top 10th in performance among those elementary schools. In other words, the results are so dramatic that if we put these kinds of principles in every school every year over a 10 year period, you have a theory of change at scale that nothing else can match. You have filled every vacancy. And within the next two years, I believe that Chicago Public Schools will be able to fill that pipeline from multiple providers, not just us. Us, new leaders, Loyola, Teach for America now has a principal preparation program that they've developed, and we'll see one or two others enter the, enter the deal as well. What's the next slide? It's mine. Okay. Do you want to mention what these handouts? Thank you for, thank you for that, yeah. Um, as we talk about what do we mean by capacity, I thought it would be good for you guys to have this as a take home. Here are 10 elements of capacity building and the very first one is the one that Tricia mentioned, which is the building of high quality teams in the school. We don't think principals can accomplish these outcomes without building high quality, high functioning teams in their schools. We have no evidence that they can. We have every evidence that when they do establish these teams, it works. So you have 10 dimensions of capacity building here that are very hard to learn. And I'll just say it, and you guys know it from your experience, most principals can't do these 10 things. If they could do these 10 things, we would have different results in schools. Can people learn to do these 10 things? Yes, they can. And we have four programs nationwide that are demonstrating that. So this is one dimension of what it means to build capacity in a school district so that your pipeline is full of people who are learning how to do these things, which have extraordinary results in student performance. The other thing to look at is this one, which is just a recent uh, University of Illinois story on this program, and it features a couple of our principals and so on, and it's useful for you to take a look at. Also, at the back of this one, the, the 10 capacities, you'll see uh, a dozen or so high schools uh, that have just brief profiles on how they're doing in the early years of our principalship. I'll tell you something you already know. It is harder to turn around a high school than it is an elementary school, other things being equal. 
but we are finding that our leading indicators in our high schools are pretty dramatic in terms of reducing dropout rate, improving freshman on track rate, that is to say percentage of freshmen who have no failing grades, um, improving dropout rate annually, and so forth and so on. What is the lever? The lever is leadership. I think that in the next 10 years, there will be national consensus on the following thing on which there is not now national consensus. Ready? The single most cost-effective lever for improving student learning outcomes in high-need schools is putting the right principle in place. The single most cost-effective lever. We are not acting that way in federal or state policy. In the next 10 years, I think that claim is going to be something that will be a matter of consensus, not a matter of challenging the status quo. Continuing on with this idea of building the bench and partnerships, I wanted to share with you a study that was done by the U.S. Department of Education in uh, mid-2004, I believe it is. They convened a group of experts and they represented uh, professional associations, higher ed, definitely state folks and um, um, practitioners. And they said, let's look at all of the leadership initiatives going on in the country. And they found 60 that they thought were innovative. And by innovative, they wanted to research what they were. They narrowed down, they narrowed down, and they finally got down to six. And the six that they featured in this publication, which you can get, and it's valuable because they're all different. One of them is a, uh, in New Jersey. It was run by the Principal Association in New Jersey. Another one is in a rural uh, Principal's Excellence Program. There are large ones uh, there, but you, in the website's on the bottom right there. If you go to that website, you'll find this. But the idea here is that there's a lot of different ways. Well, I'm going to go back to this one of the comments this morning. Context is everything. And so what they were looking for, well, what were the commonalities across the types of leadership, partnership, um, leadership development programs? And they found some that you need to think about if you're going to engage in partnerships. And so what did the, universe, the US Department of Ed found? that all of the pro six programs that were in this particular uh, report have a research-based vi vision of what effective principals do. Um, school leadership performance standards, candidate selection and screening process, and Steve's mentioned that over and over again, and that is probably the biggest and most important thing that is happening in the field, and that is selective admissions into principal preparation programs because you want to assure the best and I'm going to use the word passion. The best qualified and those passion that have that commitment to transforming schools, those are the ones that we need to spend our time and money and energy on developing. Talk about putting together folks in cohorts so that they can become communities of practice, which is the notion of the professional learning community within teachers in a school. So they experience it before they expect their teachers to work that way. Authentic leadership experiences and so forth. Steve, would you go ahead and click the next one. And of course, Wallace Foundation. You can hear, you've heard the, uh, the effort that Wallace has put in to improving leadership. And in this particular report, um, this is an earlier one than the one that, that Steve had at the bottom of his, but there are the following requirements for effective leadership preparation. Again, research-based content and a very coherent program. The notion of use of cohorts, you see this again, field-based internships, problem-based learning, mentoring, and again, this notion of collaboration. And Steve is right. None of us, the, unit, the higher education institutions, nor districts, nor professional associations can do it alone anymore. The task of developing leaders is so great that you need folks who do have that research background, who do have the practical experience, and who have that true investment in these are our these are our people. We want to make sure that they are going to be prepared to lead schools effectively in our district. So that's why it's really important to have these collaborations or these partnerships. I want to, to let you know that <clears throat> Kentucky did the same thing that Illinois did. 
all of the principal preparation programs sunset in December 31, 2011. They must be totally redesigned. They are no long, we are no longer going to be offering a master's in educational leadership or school administration. You come back, you must come into the program with a master's degree, so it is a post-master's program. Post. Must be delivered through partnerships with districts. So you can see in Kentucky where we have 172 rural partnerships is kind of an interesting idea, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes here. Um, the, the candidates screened, and it, the district and the university co-select, meaning there, is a, there are standards and there's a selection process, which means that the principal cohort in our programs, the high quality programs, will be much smaller so that we're not spending our money on people who don't want to become principals. But understanding that, the Kentucky General Assembly and the Education Professional Standards Board made a commitment the year before, and they have said all master's programs for teachers had to be redesigned into teacher leadership programs. And we at the University of Kentucky, we decided we're going to look into this. So we did an analysis of all of our graduates over a decade, and we found that those candidates who came into our program who had a master's, who had at least 8 to 12, 15 years of experience as a teacher leader, graduated from our program and are principals now, and they're very effective. But the other third of the folks who went through our program who came in without the teacher leadership experience and who came in without a graduate degree are still teachers today. So we have developed a program on teacher leadership which incorporates all of these same things for the principal. But what we wanted to do was offer opportunities for teachers who want to be part of leadership teams, who want to step out of the classroom, engage with adults in transforming schools to assure all students learn. So there's some handouts I want to share with you. And again, the Education Commission of the States has a nice flyer here that it has available about teacher leadership. And I would say if you're really looking at developing partnerships and you're looking, talking about leadership development, building the bench, start looking at what you do to prepare teachers who would be considered or tapped or identified as prospective principals one day and give them the kind of, of opportunities for leadership development. There's also a handout on, on, the, on there about preparing teachers for rural schools. And even if you're in a large district, an urban district, I would ask you to please take this and read some of these interesting things because they're applicable to you as well. But there's also some interesting things where you can come to appreciate the challenges that the high schools have. We have mentioned several sources today, and so there's a handout. We wanted to give you a one-sheet paper that has a, it's an annotated discussion of some of the sources that we've used so that when you leave here, because there's so much that we've covered, you might want to look at some of these other sources and make your own decisions and make it appropriate for the context where you work. Now we're ready. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So working collaboratively at your desk, so I mean at your tables, what we would like for you to do right now, this is your chance, we want you to talk amongst yourselves. And what we want you to do is look at these two prompts. As you're sitting there, give an overall grade to the schools you know best on how well, how well they demonstrate a deep bench of leadership capacity for improving student learning. And from that generative type of thinking. We're not defining deep bench. We want you to define that and then you can share that back with us, okay? And then what are the main obstacles to deepening the bench at scale? So we give you about, what, five, ten minutes? We really want you to talk, ten minutes, let's talk about this, okay? We'll get back with you soon.
so productive. I'm going to take you to the next two slides and leave you at your tables because we've got another prompt to move into. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why don't you do that? Because um, can I can I go to the partnership slides? That came up? Look, this is really cool. Um, this is starting to come up at our table, so I thought uh, this is. Th let me say it this way. My, my dad was a school principal for most of his career, and I'm going to tell you something that he would not let me publish, but he doesn't mind my saying. I, 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 uh, he said, look, nobody ever expected my entire career as a principal that I would have the impact on student learning outcomes. The, the ball game has changed significantly in that respect. His job was to make the school run well, was to work with teachers, was to work with parents and so on, but he said his entire, he was, he was decorated as an outstanding principal. He said, but it was never raised in any context in which I was present that I should have an impact on student learning. That was the teacher's job. And I think what we're seeing is a dramatic shift in the field right now. And part of that shift brings in other stakeholders into the ball game. And it started to perk, perk up at our table that these other partners are starting to become significant. Yes, the graphic that you have in front of you, Engaging All Leaders, you can see that it was published in Threshold, but it was the joint work by uh, Martin Blank and Betty Hale and Ira Hark Harkvy. It's a great model when you start thinking about partnerships, and you so often we think of just businesses and so forth, but I would argue here that, that they really do a nice job of laying this out because it's it's the students, and I want to go back to that for just a minute because our partners can be the students. I read an article recently in preparing for a course I'm teaching on leading organizational change, and it's by Ron Hubbard, and it's the, in the Cap'n, um, June 2007, and it's called Tinkering Change Versus System Change. And he said, let's talk about system change. He said, let's talk about what's going on in our secondary schools. What if we eliminated compulsory education law and said to the students who are teenagers at age 13, come to school if you want to. Come to school because you want to learn, because you want to be engaged, and because you're going to be part of a learning community. And if you're not interested in that, then don't come to school. But that's where churches and government and the state would then take over taking care of the custodial responsibility. He argues that if we said, come because you want to, come to be engaged, that our schools would transform because the kids who wanted to be there and their friends didn't, they would want to come to. It's, a, it's just one of those kinds of things. That we need to think about what it's like to be a student. I want to add one quick thing here also, if I could. In our team development project, we said to the teachers or an administrator, preferably the assistant uh, principal, you're going to go visit one of the other three schools. And you're going to dress like a teenager. You're going to wear a backpack on your pat back. And you're going to take a schedule that you get from the guidance office. And you're going to spend the entire day following that schedule exactly, meaning restroom breaks, getting through the halls, eating lunch in the cafeteria. And at the end of the day, you're going to sit with the principal and members of that leadership team at that school, and you're going to share what your experiences were. How many of you that are school principals right now would like for someone to do that for you? So again, think about our teach our students being partners as well. So we're going to shift you into another prompt in just a second. You'll have 12 minutes to work on that. And then we're going to open it up for large group discussion. And I would say that, for example, at UIC, we partner with all of these groups um, that, that we see on this slide because, again, as, as Tricia said earlier, the job is too big for any of us to do by ourselves. And we have a history in education. This certainly came up at the table I was sitting at. There is a status quo that is, is in the way of actually selecting the most outstanding leaders and developing them in our districts and developing in, the, in our schools for the future. And part of that status quo um, is such that um, we haven't in the past really expected school principals to have a huge impact on student performance. Now that we know it can be done, the question is how do we do it in every, every school and 
we're suggesting that we need these partners to make it happen. So we're going to turn to a partnership prompt here. If you take a look at this one, you have 12 minutes at your table uh, to do justice to this next set of questions. What are the most useful partnerships you now have for building leadership capacity? And what additional partnerships would you like to have? What would help? Uh, we see in some rural areas where the principal is doing it all on his or her own with very little partnership. Um, and we see some of that in the big city as well. Principals feel isolated. They're trying to do it on their own. This does not seem to be a recipe for change. OK, go ahead.
I didn't color. download it and print it in color. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Now, you might have your copies of yours because I made yes, notes. Yes, I didn't take them with oh, okay. uh, Unless somebody took them to a different table. Uh, have you read this one? I have an extra copy of this. Have you seen that? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. in fact, I have that. There, yeah. Good, you got it. Nice. Good. Um, nice lessons in your hair. What's this? A gift? Oh, how nice. Thank you. I got it. started. She's going to moderate for us. Okay. okay, so if you could wrap up your conversations, we're going to engage in kind of a whole group conversation. Gather back together, and for the last uh, 
15 minutes of, of this session, we're just going to open it up to a whole group conversation where um, you can pose questions that might be appropriately addressed by others in the room or it might be our panelists um, that would, would be the ones to address them, but we want to just not, not constrict this conversation too much. We want to, uh, you can talk about just takeaways, ahas, questions, um, things that have come up, and uh, we'll just start with that. And so is there anyone who'd like to, to ask a question or share something? And we're gonna, I'm going to use this, circulate this lavalier mic because it's wireless, and the other one we have is not, and I think that that's probably the safest thing for us to do. <laughs> My question, Steve, is um, you mentioned earlier that your placement of principals through your cohort groups uh, have changed the schools in within a year. Mm -hmm. um, one question is, uh, related to that, is uh, are these turnaround schools where the entire staff was replaced, or is it? Uh, yeah, I'm really glad you asked that, because um, we're, we're doing both models, and our preference is this. I'll just be real straightforward. We're recruiting people who want to go into the toughest neighborhood schools to change and change them with the teachers that are there. Now, there are several turnaround initiatives in Chicago that are recruiting our principals like crazy, as you'd imagine. Right? And so as a consequence, some of our principals end up in turnaround schools, by which I mean, and there's, you know, the U.S. Office of Education has four different models of what they mean by turnaround. W one of the that you're referring to is a school that, that releases all the teachers and everybody has to reapply for their position, if, if at all. Um, it is absolutely true that our principals who are who are privileged to hire every single teacher when they go in as a new principal are having faster and better results. So this is kind of good for us. To, I mean, this is a pretty significant research finding, right? Because these are all principals going through the same program. Some of them are taking schools in which the teachers aren't fired, and some of them are taking, taking schools in which the teachers are fired, and we are seeing faster results in the schools in which the teachers are fired. However, that said, I don't think that this solution of firing the teachers is a solution to be used at scale by any means. We are also seeing dramatic results when we're working with the staff that's there. Um, so you get the point, yeah. But also, um, the principals, um, it appears, has a tremendous backing from the district and support from the district in making those changes and, and where they're going to. Yes, th this is true. Uh, we, because it's a partnership with the district, let's underline this partnership issue again. Because it's a partnership with the district, our principals do feel very much supported by the district, whether or not it's a, quote, turnaround school. Our view is our principal's job is to turn around any school they're in, because we're going to the highest need schools. And, and yes, we are getting district support for doing that. Other questions, reactions? Um, I, I don't think there's any question that we recognize the significance of instructional leadership and focus, and, and clearly um, there's no controversy about that. But I was just wondering what your thoughts are, both of you, um, in thinking about leadership pipelines and whether your program even addresses this um, from the so-called non-traditional um, fields. Uh, whether it's military or business. Now, we've seen some examples of that at the superintendent's level, and typically they're paired with, um, supposedly paired with somebody, uh, a co-leader, who is steeped in instruction and education experiences. So I wonder what your thinking is about those potential pipelines for uh, folks that may not even have teaching experience in the classroom. One of the challenges is state policy. And in Kentucky, you have to be, have taught three years in order to be certified as a, as a principal, and there is no alter, there, there's no such thing as alternative certification as a principal. However, there is alternative certification for superintendents, because the task of the superintendent, um, it's further removed in most cases from the day in, day out work within a school. So again, I think the stumbling block to that is definitely state policy and regulations. Yeah, I, I think that it's not just a stumbling block, but there's a good principle at stake here, and that is that school leaders really need to understand instruction well. And, and to the extent to which they have demonstrated in practice that understanding, that's all the good. Now, our state law is the same as Kentucky's on that count. We, uh, our view is this, that um, 
it is possible to imagine somebody becoming a very strong school principal mm -hmm. who's never taught school. I think we have examples of that. However, I would not design a program or policy on that premise. Um, there could be some exceptional individuals who could pull this off, but it's also true that somebody could be an outstanding medical doctor without ever having gone to college. You don't build a program or policy on, the, on that exceptional insight. So at the school level, I'm much less supportive of having people who have never taught run the school than I am at the district level. Uh, just a quick side story on this. Um, once we were, as we looked at two or three uh, school superintendents in a row who ne had no education or teaching background, um, one Chicago reporter said, you know what? He said, I'm not so sure I want a news reporter running the Chicago Tribune myself. And he was pointing out that there's a different skill set at the top of the whole organization. Now, take that for what it's worth, but I think that I'm, I'm more flexible in my own thinking about a, about a district leader than I am about a school leader. And I'm shaking my head yes to everything that Steve is saying. <laughs> Yes, yeah. What, when you say fire, do you mean fire, their teaching career is over, or once the school is considered a turnaround and you eliminate the entire staff, they interview, but you can interview back in. Those who don't interview back in, are they fired, fired, no job? Yeah, thanks for making that distinction. This is something that different districts are doing in different ways, but virtually all districts are saying to the teacher, you haven't lost your tenure in this district, but it's on you to get rehired. And if that teacher can't get rehired, that is the effective end of that teacher's career, at least in that district. But no district, to my knowledge, has said, when we turn this school around, every teacher in this school is not allowed to reapply. I mean, to my knowledge, there's been, now there are different, different ways in which districts have negotiated this with local bargaining units and so on, but to my knowledge, the firing language I used uh, is intended to mean you can no longer teach at this school unless you reapply for a position, in which case you may get hired, no guarantees. Right, and, I, and I'm saying that because I'm from Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin, and we have two schools that we're doing the turnaround model. Yeah. Next year, I'm working with one that's doing the restart. That's even more difficult. But um, and doing the turnaround model, we know that only half the teachers you can bring back, up to half. You don't even have to bring back half, but right. you can bring back up to half. But it's the interviewing process that if you don't get to this school, then you go and interview at another school. So it's not okay. right. That's, I, I'm, I'm really glad you made that okay. distinction. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Were there any um, ideas or strategies that you heard from others at your tables and your table conversations that you might think about um, trying out or uh, applying in your, your context? Any takeaways? Can I mention one that I heard that I think is huge and I'd be surprised if it didn't come up at every table? It was quite clear at the table that I was sitting at that sometimes politics really get in the way of change, <laughs> right? Whether you're, yeah. whether you're talking rural or urban. And so I, I want to put a message out there to all of us in here. Schools are inherently by their nature political institutions. If we want to change schools to improve them, we have to get political. And that's why I like the title of this session or the, the theme of the session that has to do with partnerships as well as pipelines for principalships and school leadership. Because if we don't politically partner, um, we're not going to make these changes happen. You can't do it just by wanting them to happen. So I know this is a topic that comes up, but I, unfortunately, those of us that got in the field of education now have to find ourselves also as political actors as well. I, if you want to make change, I think it's unavoidable. And so I like the partnership list that Tricia put together because those are precisely the folks we have to partner with if we want to make change happen. And government. It's, it's on your list. On yeah, it's yeah. on, that on your list. We have a senator who has become the state superintendent. Wow. Mm -hmm.
through our first year of, of turnaround. What impeded it a bit is we had a week and a half, they gave us a week and a half notice before school started. So within that week and a half, we had to eliminate 50% oh, no. of our teachers and hire back 50%, you know, new incoming. Not good. No. Now they set up for it because we had to wait for the final approval from the state, I guess, is what I was told. At the end of the year, you know, they had it all, they, they had teachers to, to make room for those people that didn't get accepted back into our school. You really had an early retirement buyout is what, what really, went, really happened. Um, some of those teachers took it and made okay vacancy. So now no other high school in our district can hire anybody until everything occurs and is settled at, at Hammond. Mm -hmm. And so within a week and a half, we interviewed all of our staff, had to get rid of half, and then we had to start looking for new. And it was almost simultaneously we're doing, you know, that kind of a process. Now the things we looked at, teacher attendance, teacher performance, you know, we had all the records and files and folders, and then plus the interview. So, I mean, it is a difficult process. I remember staying late nights and wondering, I, I think I forgot what my home looked like, but, uh, you know, it, it was a, it, it's a, I, I guess the most painstaking you'll be going through it, it sounds like a process that you'll go through because even though some of those teachers, in my opinion and what I saw, I didn't want them to come back, it's still a person and it's still somebody's livelihood. I think the thing that benefited me the most is I kept two things in mind. One, it's for the kids and two, they are going on and they do have a livelihood still. I mean, that's how you gotta do it. Okay, okay. so I think we're um, ready to wrap up. Um, I think we heard a lot today about the value of, of leaders and leadership and then also um, the, the importance of partnerships and building, preparing, supporting, expanding the capacity of leaders. So. Um, I want to thank you all for participating, and I'd also like to round of applause for our two panelists. Thank you. And uh, I'll note that there, all of the resources that were uh, distributed and referenced um, will be up on, or if they're not already, on the website for the conference under this session. And um, we may potentially add some more in there, and depending on, on what's out there, and if the, the panelists have some ideas for other resources you might be interested in. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.